freestyle travel. Hey everybody, Kenny Flannery here. In this episode we have Liz Stewart. Uh, so we got a, a video podcast this episode. Uh, recorded this with Liz yesterday in Iowa. So we'll jump in with her here in a second. And then uh, afterwards I'll tell you how I hitchhiked from Wyoming to Iowa. It was uh, pretty easy. And where I am right now. But without further ado, let's jump in and uh, talk to Liz Stewart. All right, this is Liz Stewart. Was this your third or fourth time on the podcast? Kidding, I think it's like my fifth. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Wait, let's see. Where did we see each other? We saw each other in, we recorded in Biloxi, we recorded in Albuquerque. Recorded in Texas. We recorded in Texas. So it's at least your fourth time. At least four, yeah. I think it's four. I'm a podcast professional now. All right, so where are we now? Now, guess. Guess? (laughs) I was about to say I know, but then I was like... Guess where we are. I actually had to think. No, no, no. We're in Iowa now. We're in the Midwest. We're taking on a whole... Sorry about my cat. Um, (laughs) We're taking on a whole new beast. We're in the Midwest. We're in Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, We are right in the heart of downtown, and I love it. Yep, we are right in the heart of downtown. We just recorded an episode of my hopping show at a Jackson Street Brewery, which is like a block that way, half a block, you could say. Yeah, and we're like, what, like probably five or six blocks from Mardo's. Yep, Mardo's. Brew City. We've been to all the breweries. Brew City's <laughs> awesome. Yep. I had fun. I had fun there. This was a cool weekend in Sioux City. We had Rag Bry, 50th year of Rag Bry, which is like one of the biggest cycling events in the world. Uh, it's the biggest casual cycling event, the biggest, the longest, and another superlative. <laughs> I forget. But it's 30,000 people that just uh, cycle from here. They spend seven days yeah. cycling across the state, and there's basically a festival. Every step of the way, and it started here. It started here, and it was awesome. And there's like a couple of things I want to compliment everybody on on that. Yeah. It was so positive for the city. Like... We walked down by the river, and there were tents set up, and... That was awesome. Everybody was in there. It was, like, so organized and uniform, and, like, these people weren't all together. You know what I mean? Like, people came together and, like, organized this campsite. There wasn't a piece of trash left that I saw. Nope. We went there today, two days after, and there was no evidence of... Not a trace. Thousands of people camping there. Yeah, it was like such a good display of self-discipline, man. And they like when we went, we went around like what one a.m. Yeah. And everybody was in their tents. It was holy. It was. It was spiritual. Yeah. 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 It was amazing. And like I think um, I quit smoking over the weekend, and I quit smoking cigarettes over the weekend. And I think like I may get a bike and like try to do it next year. Like I was so impressed by what I saw, and it was like so uplifting. Like and it was like such a healthy thing. It like inspired me to be more healthy, and um, I think I'm gonna get a bike, and I think I may try to do it next year because it's something I want to be a part of. It was so freaking positive, man. I was tempted to uh, hitch along. <laughs> I know you were. I could tell yeah. in your eyes. You had this look in your eyes, like where are they going? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to go. I was like, I'm pretty sure I couldn't get my hands on a bike. I mean, I'm sure I could have if I put my mind to it. But I was kind of sure. tempted to just follow along and see, but also like. I'm glad that we also experienced, so we we went to the beer fest at uh, Jackson Street, mm-hmm. which was like catering to some of these people, and then late night, it was like, yeah, one in the morning, we walked down, and they were all peaceful and nestled in their beds, and then there was the gazebo, which was totally empty and everyone respected, no one was camped, like yeah. in that inner circle. They didn't touch it. But then we walked near the casino and there was like an ambulance. Debauchery. Like Down by work and church, yeah. Full on debauchery. And it was uh-huh. like, whoa. So there is that going on too. <laughs> There's always that going on. That's like that into the road. Yeah. So that you know? might not have even had a lot to do. I'm sure there weren't that many cyclists there. But I was, nah. part of me was like happy. Kind of just like, also, <laughs> there is that. All these people are like a mile away, like nestled. 
into sleep. In this peaceful, <laughs> spiritual, healthy place. And yeah. then you round the corner and it's like ambulances and stretchers <laughs> and like yeah. women in, in tank tops stumbling around. And she did not fucking say that. Yeah, <laughs> like was. arguments. And then um, that conversation we had with that guy was cool. The guy who had brain surgery that we ran into. Oh, yeah. That was Chucked a cool his moment. Brain out. And, and uh, we ran into this guy and he was telling us about how he had just had his, part of his skull removed. They removed part of his brain. And then he like ended it with, you know, life is a beautiful experience full of difficult situations. You know, if the sun comes up tomorrow and the birds are chirping, be grateful, enjoy it. Yeah. And like I needed that in that moment and it was just so cool. Hmm. Benjamin. <laughs> this is our friend Benjamin Franklin. This is my new cat my yeah. companion. For those watching the video, you're, <laughs> you're seeing this. For those listening. Uh, it, it never stops. Benjamin Franklin. So tell the people that are familiar with uh, the cast and you. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that, yeah, it is the last episode was you in Texas. I was in Texas. Yeah, I was working on. What's the, the uh, nutshell or the extended version or whatever you want to say since Texas to now? That's been about, it's probably a year, year and a half, about five a year, months. About a year, yeah. <laughs> I can't keep track. It's been over a year because we, you got there right when I um, got to Texas and I had 90 day, I had 90 days clean. We filmed oh, yeah. on my 90th day, no. and you came into Texas, and I ended up staying in Texas um, until about this time last year is when I left. Okay, so over a year mm -hmm. since that last yeah. uh, podcast. And I left and kind of hit the road, and I ended up in Iowa. And um, how did how did you wind up? In I don't Iowa? really know. <laughs> I don't really I mean, know. It's Iowa. It's Iowa. It's not and like I'm California here. or Florida or New York. No, no, no. I ended up in Iowa. Um, it's intentional. But it ended up working out, so um, I ended up getting an, an awesome job here, and I'm a literacy coach at an elementary school now, and like um, that's been huge because I ended up getting accepted back into college, and like my job's helping me pay for school, and uh, you know, and I managed to, to stay off the drugs. Like I'm coming up on my 11th month. Um, off of the drugs and like my brain is so different now like it's healing and like you know I, I you've watched me go through a lot and I failed a lot I've had a lot of small like I've had a lot of successes I've had a lot of failures just like everybody um, but I'm getting back to a place where I'm able like I couldn't complete task I I isolated for a, on and off for five years Honestly, and now that I'm able to like honestly appraise that, you know, um, I failed very publicly at one point. I had a very, March. Yeah, I had a very public failure. Um, you know, I had a, I experienced the loss of a loved one. Um, I abused myself for years, and you know, I just I didn't know what to do, and I was just super lost and. And I'm like, I was in this rut, and you know, I get, I get clean for a little while, I'd relapse. I'd get clean for a little while, I'd relapse. I get clean for a little while, I'd relapse. And like, you know, I got to Iowa, and I plugged in with this community, and I found a mentor, and I started taking advice, and I kept, kind of kept my head down and worked, and I, I started doing a lot of internal work and spiritual work, and that's been the most, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done for myself. Um, it took me a minute to adjust, like. It's hard to go from living in total seclusion to like being out in society again. Yeah, that place in Texas, there was no uh, <coughs> walking down the street to the convenience store, let alone the bar or the park or anything. I was in the middle of nowhere. Right. I lived. I lived in total seclusion, and like even like prior to that, you know, we had COVID, and and I lived, you know, in Kansas City, I lived in that hostel, which I got some social interaction there, but I didn't really leave that place. You know what I mean? Like I stayed kind of at Waypoint. Hmm. But you um, had the the option. Texas, I had the option, but Texas, like, you I couldn't walk use it. seven miles to anything. Oh, absolutely not. I didn't have the option. Yeah. So I wasn't out in the world. And then, like, you know, I went from, like, living in total seclusion to being back out into society and, like, trying to reacclimate myself to just kind of being a regular person because <laughs> I hadn't been one for so long, you know, yeah. since, what, 2018, you know, because I was someone who was you know, planning this major event. And then I went into pretty much hiding. 
In Texas? Um, and I went to Texas and pretty much hid. You know, I, I've been... Well, you had a relapse in between though, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, briefly. Where were you between... So you left Texas and then you went where? Between there I and Iowa? I left Texas. I went to Kansas City. Um, and I was in Kansas City for a few weeks. I had a brief relapse. And, you know, that <laughs> lasted a month or two. Um, end up in Iowa. And I ended up getting a mentor and, and just asking for help. Like, I surrendered to it because I had so much space between myself and the drugs after going to Texas. And I think me being in Texas was, like, divine intervention, honestly. Like, those people probably helped save my... They did. Those people helped save my life. Yeah. And, um, you know, I I had this little, like, two-month deal. And, and I knew, like, I knew I was like, this is not what I want to be doing. This is not what I want to be doing. Because I had put enough space between myself and the drugs, like I said. And... Um, you know, I reached out and I asked for help. I was like, I don't want to be doing this. This is not the direction I want to be going. You know, I'd gotten a really good job and and I'd gotten accepted back into school. And I know where drugs lead me every time. Yeah. You know, they don't lead me to good places. I was putting myself in unsafe situations. I was treating myself like a worthless piece of garbage because I felt like garbage. Yeah. I felt like total garbage, you know. Um I had a lot of public failures. I struggled with a lot of different things. I, I'm coming to realize, like, I struggle with a lot of perfectionism. Like, I want to be perfect. And it's hard for me to admit that, like, even sitting here talking to you. But, like, even, no. like, with that event I was planning, like, I wanted it to go off perfectly. Yeah. And it caused me to do nothing. And, um, you know, I've been punishing myself for not being perfect. And I'm never going to be perfect, you know? Yeah, well, you've been telling me just, like, it's better to do something than nothing, you know? Right, and, like, my mentor kind of, like, ingrained in me. She says, the only wrong way to do things is to not do them. That's what you've been saying, yeah. The only wrong way to do it is to not do it. And, like, I'm taking that advice and I'm running with it and it's working for me. Hmm. You know, I'm able, like, I'm, I'm achieving these small goals because, like, I had no goals for years. Like, I was so lost in the world. And um, I had bad self-esteem. I had no self-respect. You know, people who respect themselves typically don't pump themselves full of drugs. <laughs> yeah. You know, they don't put themselves in, in houses with people they don't know full of random drugs. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I didn't care about my life at one point. And, and now I know, having gone through what I went through, that, like, my purpose on this planet is and always has been to help others. Because, like, when you and I first met, I was, like, in this space where I was trying to help a lot of other people. Yeah. And I thrived in doing so. You were organizing the uh, pot march. I was organizing you know? the, mar the National March for Marijuana. And, like, you know, I I failed very publicly because I tuned into the negative stuff. You know what I mean? I tuned into that. And then yeah. I tried to drown that out because I internalized all that bad stuff. And I'm like, gosh, like, people will really hate me, you know? And that's all I heard. But, gosh... <laughs> There were thousands of people cheering me on, respecting what I was doing. You know what I mean? But sometimes it's so easy to hear the negative and then not believe the positive. Yeah. And um, I'm just at a, this really cool space in my life where I'm beginning to see the positive and, and like the people who bring more of that positivity into my life. I'm I'm rolling with those people, and the rest is just noise to me at this point. You know, I I uh, I punished myself for five years. And I'm realizing, like, that doesn't have to last forever. You know, we, we go through dark stuff in life and things happen, but we don't have to live there. You know what I mean? I thought yeah. that I, had, I, I deserve to live in this dark space alone and just waste <laughs> away. And I really believed that. And, you know, and my addiction and the drugs were telling me, you know, you'll never see your family again. You're never going to see your son again. Um, you deserve the way that these men are treating you. You, you know... Um, just all this bad stuff that addiction tells us that we begin to believe because I started feeling so bad. And um, I had this moment of clarity. It was weird, you know. I have had these moments of clarity throughout my addiction, which I've talked to you about a lot of times, where I would just break and, re and ask for help. Yeah. You know, and I had this moment of clarity where I was like, you know, if I believe that other people can recover and other people can go on to live successful lives post-addiction... If I believe that for them, why don't I believe that for me? Right. You know what I mean? I never believed that for myself. And I found someone, this woman who invested time with me and um, helped me. Like, I, there's so much I didn't know how to do anymore. And she really helped. She took time out of her day to help me and mentored me. And I have another spiritual advisor that I can consult with. 
And these people helped me and I asked, I started asking for advice, but I didn't even know how to ask for help at one point. You know what I mean? Like I was just so, I went to this place where, especially like in back in when I was doing all my event planning and stuff where I began to become afraid and my ego took over as a defense mechanism. Hmm. So, you know, we live, we have the spiritual side and then we have our ego, which will always be there. You know, yeah. I'll always have fear and I'll always have ego. But what I'm learning that I can't do is let my, the ego drive the car. You know, and I did that for a long time and, and it, it almost killed me. Um, so I've been working on, on my spiritual side and I was spiritually void for a very long time. Like, um, I like to say that because of the abuse that I have inflicted on my body, I spiritually evacuated <laughs> because my body wasn't a safe place for me to be. Yeah. And and mentally, you know, the drugs had taken over. Um, you know, my next stop was physical death, really. You know, because I was mentally gone, emotionally void, spiritually dead. And uh, my next stop, you know, was physical death. It's never too far with what you were doing. Like, it's always one wrong... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, when I'm, I'm step one, away. Yeah, it's like it's playing Russian roulette with my life, and that's what I was doing on a regular basis, you know. And so I started believing that other people could recover, and I started believing like there are people who have had the same things, dealt with the same things that I've dealt with, who've gone on to live happy, successful lives, of course, and made something mm. of themselves and been able to help other people. And so I, I, it clicked one day. I'm like, why don't I believe that for me? So I started believing like small positive things for myself and it's been a struggle because my internal self-talk was very, very bad. Huh. And what I started doing was I started the th bad things I would think, I would turn around like there was someone next to me and I would start saying them like I was saying them to a friend. Huh. And I realized how bad they were. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would start correcting myself. So I had to start working there. It's all internal. Everything's internal. You know yeah. what I mean? And and I realized like I was disrespecting the hell out of myself. And that was overflowing in the er every area of my life. Like I disrespected myself. I started disrespecting my environment. I started disrespecting my friends. I started, you know, disrespecting my, my family. I disrespected everything, you know? And I treated everything like garbage because I felt like garbage. Hmm. And it became so apparent that it, I, it physically manifested into me just trashing everything that I touched. So how long was it in Texas that you went without? Eight months. Eight months. I had eight months, yeah. And then you moved to Kansas City. Uh-huh. And you started using right away? No, no, I gave it some time, but I moved. Like within a week, within it, a it month? Was a, it was a couple of weeks. Um, I had gotten triggered. And I went from living on 32 acres of like wide open space with gardens and horses and flowers and sunrises. And <laughs> Were you sunsets. back at Waypoint? Were you back at no, the... No, 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 no. I was in this little basement apartment with a friend of mine. Basement apartment. A Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what I was getting to. I'm on like 32 acres of like, you know, utopia pretty much. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you're um, in a Kansas City basement. And then I'm in a basement in Kansas Ooh. City and I'm like not seeing sunshine. I'm start sleeping all the time. I got, I started experiencing depression, which when you go from an environment like that to a basement <laughs> apartment, I, yeah, you experience a yeah. change and I experienced depression and all I, and I was back out in the world and like, I didn't even have an ID. You know what I mean? And I'm like, what do you mean? I have to go get an ID and a job and... <laughs> You know, because I had been just like living in total peace out here. And, um, yeah. And so, you know, I was like, I don't know what to do. And, and the thing I did know how to do was drugs. Yeah. I knew how to do that very good because I did that for years. So, how, how Iowa? Have you, did you ever come here when you were a kid to Sioux City specifically? No, no, no. Or I had never been to Sioux City before. So, how did, how did this even pop up? I ended up on a Greyhound. Well, that's how you got here. But yeah, like, I got why? here on a Greyhound. Why didn't you go to Florida or New York or? Uh, well, a friend of mine was like, come here. And I said, okay. And I got <laughs> on a Greyhound and I came here. Okay. And, and you um, brought all your shit? What did you have I in just your had life? a suitcase. Just a suitcase? I had one suitcase. And the apartment we're in now is mine. Yeah. Like this, I own this couch. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sleeping which, on this which couch. Which is still crazy. It's comfy, right? Yeah. 
Like yeah. that table is mine. And I've been sleeping on that. That was the PP3. That purple Premier 3. Shameless Ooh. plug. <laughs> Shameless Shit. plug for that is purple a, mattresses. It is pretty nice. It's pretty nice. I didn't <laughs> sleep for a really long time. So like the one thing I did for, one nice thing I did for myself, I said, you deserve rest. And um, I bought myself a very nice uh, purple Premier 3 mattress. And let me tell you, it's changed my sleep game. Yeah. Which, I mean, I, I value my sleep now. I understand how important rest is because I didn't allow myself to rest for so long. All right, let me ask you this. Uh-huh. What's the longest you've stayed up for seven, at a time? Seven days. Seven days? I stayed up for seven days, yeah. That's pretty good. I had a I nervous mean, breakdown at the end of that because I found out that the Amazon, like the rainforest was burning down on okay. day seven. And I saw this <laughs> picture of like this monkey screaming and holding its baby. Yeah. And I'm running around my house in a robe with a credit card. And I'm like, we got to do something. And my friend's like, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, I'm buying a tree. So we, And she's like, don't, don't tree. purchase a tree it's gonna burn down and i'm like i'm going to detox <laughs> like Damn. somehow the amazon burning down forced me into detox seven days straight I stayed up for seven days yeah wow it's so bad for you street drugs are so bad for us like i don't know people think that they can just mess around with these drugs and like i'm here to tell you it's just such a bad idea like i look back on the things that i've done and the stuff i've put into my body and the person i am today Versus the person who was doing that stuff, I'm like, I can't imagine doing that now. Like, where I'm at in my life now. Like, I can't imagine. Well, no, I've been here for maybe not a week, but about a week. Yeah. And every single day I've been here, weekday, weekend, you've been out of here by 6.30 yeah. for a meeting mm -hmm. until 7.30. Yeah. And every single day, also at 10.30, you've gone to a meeting at 11.30, yeah. just like, religiously. Yeah. I do it religiously. Yeah. Um, I'm not religious. Um, well, but, you know. But I do that stuff because, one, it helps me, and, two, um, you know, and we show up for other people. You know what I mean? Like, I'm taking on, like, commitments and stuff. And, um, you know, m somebody gave me something so freely. Like, my mentor shared her experience with me freely, and the least I can do is, is, is share mine, you know. Um, in hopes that nobody, that nobody has to die from this. People die from addiction. Yeah. And um, good people, you know, good people. Like, yeah. at their core, like, they're good people, you know. Like, I'm learning, I'm, I'm getting to know myself again, like, out in the world as a woman. And, and, like, I'm beginning to like myself again for the first time in, like, five years. Which yeah. is, has been hard. Like... You know, I get up early and I hit I hit the streets and I'm out and I, I'm doing my best to be of use in my community because I wasn't for so long. You know, I was a very useful person in my community at one point. Yeah. And I lost that. And when I lost that, I lost myself. And I lost my connection. I lost connection is what I really lost. I lost my connection to others. You know, because I failed and I went into hiding. I went into total hiding and like... I well, you were getting after when I met you. I was obviously after you it. were you were peaking. You yeah, know? you were yeah. getting after it. I mean, obviously you were. I don't remember if right when I met you, you were throwing that event, or if yeah, it happened shortly it. after. But uh, yeah, you were um, you know at the peak. But it seems like now too, just being here, like everyone I've talked to, I've just been like, yeah, I'm loving Sioux City because it's probably just because who I'm with you. Yeah. They're like. Right downstairs is this coffee shop, or, which is also an art gallery, yeah. and everyone's connected. And we're walking around town. Uh, for those listening and watching, there's like a skyway. Yeah, through the skywalk. The skywalk through yeah. the city. Uh, and that's full of art from your friends now. Yeah, people <laughs> like, I know. Like, people I, I uh, socialize with, and like, I'm getting plugged, slowly plugged into the art community here. Yeah. You know, because I was a pretty big artist in Mobile back in the day. Yeah, and now too, like the murals and your, the murals are about to be filled with your art. Yeah, I applied to be a muralist um, here, and and if I get accepted, I'll be doing a mural in the alley here, and and like that's huge for me. That's huge because like I haven't, you know, I've done underground stuff here and there, like on this like really weird layer of the internet, and like I'm kind of like reemerging to the surface, like I'm becoming visible again. And that's terrifying for me because of my past. 
But it's also quite motivating because I got a second chance at my life. You know, like I'm starting to like ramp back up and remember like who I was. Like, oh, I was somebody who made phone calls. I was somebody who who created things. I was someone who, you know, handed out flyers. Yeah. You know, and I'm getting kind of back in the groove to all that. And I forgot how good it felt to like be of use in my community and, and really lead people. And, you know, I talked to you about getting back into school and like my minor is organizational leadership and management. So I'm preparing to study organizational behavior, which I think is going to be great for me because I have skills, but I just need to fine tune and more education never hurts. You can't be overeducated, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting back into the groove of like, you know, being involved. I got hooked up um, with the League of Women Voters here and like I'm getting ready to meet with them to help women get out and vote. And that's like, those are things that I was passionate about for a long time that I um, that I let go of and, and lost sight of uh, because of my personal failure, you know what I mean? And, and uh, unfortunately, when that happened, you know, I found a drug that made me feel a way that I was incapable of feeling at that time. Yeah. And I was like, this has to be my answer. And it wasn't. Um, it caused me a lot of problems and, and I lost touch with myself. Like I lost, I was soulless for a really long time. And, uh, you know, I've, I've decided to turn my will and my life over to the spirit of the universe and, and really surrender again. Because, like, when we met and I was planning that event, I was just kind of following my heart wherever I felt led to be and, like, led to do. And it was working for me. And it was working for other people. And I'm learning how to get back into that space, that flow state. Yeah. You know, that flow space, which, you know as a creative we need to get into um and be used as a me as more of a medium yeah and kind of let my ego take the back seat which i can use my ego to do certain things like i'm using my ego to quit smoking because i get this sense of like superiority by saying oh i'm an ex-smoker <laughs> you know we can we can use that for good things um but what i can't do is allow it to drive my car what do you, you got know? to say about those toothpicks though <gasps> <laughs> Shameless plug. This is uh, a toothpick, right? I've Zipix. been looking at this toothpick. I got nicotine. Okay, so I. I smoked. might start rocking this toothpick for the rest. Of, is this a normal toothpick, or is this this must? No, be I don't own normal toothpicks. This so is a loaded toothpick. It's, it's loaded. Yeah. I'm gonna use it on the podcast. So I got. Um, does it smell good? Which one is? Let me. Smell might be it. peppermint. I don't know. Most definitely, I can smell again. So I was smoking <sighs> like a pack a day. And I smoked for 20 years. And while, while Kenny was here during Ragbri, I quit smoking. I've been quit for, I haven't bought a pack of cigarettes in five days. And uh, I got these nicotine infused toothpicks called Zipix. And they seem to be doing the trick. We're at a concert I'm, and I'm standing in the back smoking a toothpick. I'm actively getting addicted to these toothpicks. <laughs> Don't get addicted to stuff. Ah, oh, I mean... Me getting addicted to something is just like, that was a fun four days. <laughs> like, That's the difference between me and you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because like you'll get addicted to something for four days and put it down. And I'm like, let's go ruin my life. <laughs> yeah. It's also, I don't know, travel is a weird thing. I guess if I really wanted to get addicted to something, I could. You're addicted to travel. I'm addicted to travel. But as far as like a substance, I've thought about this. Well... Beer, I can do. Beer, I can get addicted to. Right? I don't know. Alcoholism is not pretty. It's not pretty, right? So I could be an alcoholic if I really wanted to. But I feel like it would be harder to be addicted to toothpicks. <laughs> or cocaine, even. Like Cocaine I, is an expensive addiction. Yeah. So if I wanted to get addicted to cocaine, it'd be really hard for me. Right. At the way I travel. Like, and probably the financial standpoint, too. The financial thing would be tough. <laughs> I feel like, huh. This, all right, so this would be interesting. What if, How uh, would you go about getting addicted to cocaine? I want to do it. So this is going to be you a test. You want to do it. Oh, just as a test. <laughs> just okay. A, uh, so let's see if I can help it anyway. So let's, let's do, do this. Do you need some cocaine? Do uh, you have some cocaine right now? No, but I could probably make a couple phone calls. That's what I'm saying. So what if, like, um, some of the... the the hopping show or whatever started taking off. And what if I was just getting blasted with one to $5,000 a month in my account because of uh, the hopping show, and because of Hobo Lifestyle. So I just had that money. I could probably find cocaine anywhere I want. I guess I could, right? 
I mean, you cocaine's not what it used to be. So it's like... <laughs> well, see, that's the other thing. There's that fentanyl shit. There's fentanyl, right. And which, that shit freaks me out a little bit because, like, I guess the thing with fentanyl is that, like, it's not evenly uh, mixed and stuff. Right, so even if you test your drugs, I researched all this because I, yeah. was, I was, like, testing stuff, right? Because I didn't want to die. Yeah, because it can clump and stuff, so it's right. like, Right, ah. so even if you test your drugs, the portion of the drugs that you test may not have fentanyl in them, but the rest of your drugs may have fentanyl in there. It's so so obnoxious. even if you use a test strip on a certain portion of your drugs, you are still at risk for fentanyl exposure. So it'd be much harder for me. Because if I live somewhere, then I might know Joey or whatever, whoever, who I know is consistent. And he's never getting fentanyl or shit. But you shit. can't say never. Because a lot of people say, I'll never get fentanyl and they die. Not never, but I'd have a much better chance. Versus, I'm in Sioux City, and then I'm in Omaha, right, or and like then I'm in Minneapolis, and I'm always just like, oh, well, this is my boy. He, like, it'd be much harder. Yeah, I was getting like a known fentanyl addict to mail me drugs, which was a bad idea. Yeah. So it's, it's hard for me as a traveler to get to addicted to pretty much anything. I say pretty much anything, but then I think of all the things. Like, alcohol is so fucking easy. If I wasn't a cigarettes... So easy. God, cigarettes are easy to get addicted to. And they're yeah. everywhere, you know. They're just like, and there's different brands. Like, it's So rough. I guess like being broke most of the time is super helpful. It is, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like I can I, barely uh, afford the beer that I love. I can never afford cigarettes. You're saying a pack of cigarettes like is like 10 bucks or something. Yeah, I, I was spending 10 to 10, 11 dollars a day. But sometimes 20 bucks a day if I was just flying through them, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, even if I was smoking half a pack a day, that'd be 5 bucks a day. That'd be a disaster. If I put all that money in the bank this year, next summer I'll have $4,000. I think I want to go to Thailand. I like that idea. We should do it. Like For $4,000, we could have a, a cool Thailand trip. I spend about $4,000 a year in my life. Right. I was telling you that earlier. We can spend on one vacation and have a blast. So since 2007, I think the least I've spent in one year is about 2000 and the most is around probably 7000 That's cool. For 15, 16 years. And you're happy. Yeah. yeah you're content. No, it's been like, you're living great. your best life. You're writing books. You're filming. You know, you're doing all the things you want to do. Yeah. But I also... You know, that's being on the road. I don't pay rent. I don't, there's right. a lot of things I don't have to pay for. Less is more. Uh, a lot of habits I don't have to pick up, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, if you can be uh, saving for, no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, saving $4,000 a month, like that is a, a year. That's a, yeah, a year. That's a trip to anywhere. Anywhere. It, yeah. You take your average person who hopefully gets a, week or two vacation if you're committed to a bunch of stuff like that's a pretty sick vacation four thousand bucks wait. it's like worth it you know like it's more motivation to stop and and two i want to live longer i want to have more time with my son you know and my family you're going to kansas and city my soon? friends yeah i'm going next month to see my boy um i saw him last in february and i'm gonna see him again next month he's getting so big he's seven and, uh, <laughs> I got yeah. footage of him with the uh, 360 camera in Waypoint. I oh, really, I would love to see that. I thought I sent it to you. You probably so. did. Who knows, Kenny? My mind's been all over the place. But yeah, it's hard to get addicted to stuff when you travel like that. Like, you know, I would, I'd hit the road here and there throughout my addiction, and like, it helped me put the drugs down for a few days. You know, it's it's hard to fly around the country with a bunch of drugs on you. Ah. Uh... Yeah, I guess it depends on the drugs. I left, I was flying to Portland and I had drugs in my bag and I left the bag on the plane in Denver. And they sent it back to you, right? So I got clean for like two weeks. I filled out a lost and found form and like- Shout out to Hopping, Breakside, Sober Liz. Thank you. <laughs> gigantic. And- You there for Gigantic? And yeah, shout out to gigantic. Frontier Airlines because I filled out a lost and found form and they mailed my drugs to my house. So <laughs> I've been clean for like two weeks and I open my door and there's this package on the steps and I open it up and it's my bag full of drugs off their flight. That's so nice of them though. And I was like, well, here we go. And I proceeded to get high for like seven months. 
Jeez. Yeah. So that's how it works, though, man. Like once once it's in me, it's on and popping. So like you know, I yeah. can't lose that fight if I don't step into that arena. Well, what's up now? What do you mean? I mean, what if I just handed you a palm full of drugs? I'd flush it down the toilet. Okay, so something's changed. Yeah, something changed. Yeah. I knew when I surrendered this year, um, like two weeks later, I got drugs in the mail that I forgot someone was sending me. And um, when I got them, I poured them down the sink. And that's when I knew. I knew I was done because I had never done that before. Hmm. Like, I, I never believed. Even like, you know, um, my boyfriend was a heroin addict and... He had brought heroin into the house, and I didn't throw it away. I put it in my backpack because I would not throw drugs away. Yeah. I would either sell them or do them. Oh, okay. And so um, I knew when I when I poured those those free drugs, <laughs> when I threw those free drugs away, like I knew I was done. And I haven't touched I haven't touched them, I haven't touched drug in eleven months. You know. Did I tell you about the meth I got in Kansas City ever? I don't think I told you this. No. What happened? <laughs> I think it was the first time I really spent time in Kansas City. I couch surfed. Stop <laughs> it. We're doing an interview. <laughs> Benjamin. God, Benjamin. This. Um, so I think it's the first time I really spent time in Kansas City. And I was couch surfing. It was this girl. And she took me like all over the place. Mm-hmm. It was a really good night. And somewhere towards the end of the night, we were at like an uh, outdoor-ish bar. And she was kind of just like, oh, it's kind of chilly. And as she said that, one of the bartenders walked by. And she's like, that coat rack, uh, those coats have been here for like over a week. Grab a coat. Keep it. Both of you. So we both went over there and like both grabbed coats. I was like, fuck it, yeah, it's a little chilly. Right. And like we put on these coats and we continued the night. And then uh, an hour or two later, we got back to her place and we were still wearing the coats. And I was like, oh, shit, we should check the pockets. We got these free coats. And uh, sure enough, mine had a bag of meth in it. I didn't know what it was because I'd I'd never uh, fucked with meth until uh, you, motherfucker. I don't want to talk about that. (laughs) I feel so bad about that. It's funny. Um, It's not funny. It's funny to me. Well, as long as it's funny to you, I feel terrible about that. We will mention it here. But I, I yeah. wasn't sure if it was crack or meth or whatever, but it was yeah. a bag full of fucking rocks. And um But but to your point or to my point, like I I couldn't get rid of it. And I'm not even addicted to whatever it is. Right. But I was like, I can't throw this out. This is something of value to somebody. Like somebody values I'm not, that a lot. So I had that for I don't know, like three months or a year and a half. <laughs> It might have been a year and a half. I just had it buried in my backpack because I was just like, this is something for somebody. And then finally, I think I was in uh, Hollywood with my sister. And she had some weirdo, not a boyfriend, but somebody who was just like into whatever. And I was like, look what I got. And he's like, I can use that. Give me that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They'd be glad I didn't find it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So it was useless to me and my sister, but that dude was like, oh, I'll take it. But it was, I, was, I was just like, I can't get rid of it because it's uh, something. So right. it actually is a statement to you, a testament to you that you knew what you had and you fucking flushed it. Oh, I knew exactly what it was. Yeah. It was good stuff too. And, and I, uh, I flushed it and I told the guy who sent it to me, I said, I just want you to know I got that package and I want you to know that I threw it away. Don't ever send me anything again. I'm done. And I meant it, and I was done. And, um, you know, I, I had a moment the other day. I'm having these moments where I'm realizing, like, my mind's changing about a lot of stuff, which is great. Um, <laughs> the ability to change your mind is, is, is important, you know? Yeah. It's important. It feels good sometimes. It feels amazing because um, changing my mind saved my life. Um, I had a moment the other day. I was walking in the Skywalk because it overlooks the bus station. And I was watching this girl get arrested, and they were pulling bags out of her duffel bag. And they were putting oh, into evidence. Shit. She had a duffel bag full of drugs. Damn. Brutal. And I, um, I was watching that happen in the bus station, and I thought to myself, thank God those drugs are off the street. <laughs> oh, damn. That was your and thought? And I was like, that's new. <laughs> that's yeah. a new thought. 
you yeah. know and and what it shows me is that i can change and people can change and i like i said i believed that for others i never believed it for me but once once i started believing it and i heard my mentor tell me like you're done you quit congratulations way to go because i feel like people quit and then they don't believe that they've quit okay like for me i was like well did i really quit yeah. You know, and so like I come into contact with these people who are like, I don't know, like two weeks sober, right? Yeah. And, and like I'll congratulate them and like pump them up because that's what I needed was like I'm doing something because I felt so worthless, man. I felt like I couldn't do anything. And I was so scared and traumatized. Drug addiction is traumatic. It is tra- it, it, it's traumatic. I, I did a lot of trauma therapy um, last year, like for probably, let's see, for five months, uh, I worked with a trauma therapist, and um, I think I'm getting ready to go do another cycle through with them because sometimes things will mellow out, and then like, you know, as I do this internal work, things come up, and I always like to discuss it with with the appropriate person, yeah. um, just so that I know that I'm safe and I know that I'm getting the help that I need. But drug addiction is traumatic, and it, and it affects a lot of people a lot more than just the addict, you know. I got a seven-year-old kid that I'll be making amends to until the day I die for everything, you know, from not being there. And I, I, I was an absent parent, and um, I put my family through a lot. Like, they, I might feel like my family was bracing themselves for my death. You think he, he's seven years old? He's seven, yeah. He doesn't know that you've done any drugs. Or does he? I, I feel like I feel like it may have been mentioned, you know. Um, but you know what, even if it has been mentioned, like, that's not true anymore. You know, that's not who I am anymore. Yeah. Um, I got a second chance to turn my life around and, and like get back in touch with myself and, and, and that's available for everybody. Like people can turn their lives around. We've seen how many people do it. You know what I mean? Like you, you look at all these people who write books about things like addiction. There are people who turn their lives around and help others do the same. And yeah, like, all the time. And that's hard stuff to write about. And it's like embarrassing to put out sometimes. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm getting to this place where I'm putting my ego in this backseat. And I'm seeing how my experience can potentially benefit somebody else. Um, and, and I'm trying to be as candid as possible with it. Um, because, you know, I wanted to write, write this book. And a lot of it was ego driven and, and, you know, I wanted to write this memoir and like, as a way to like put my side of the story out there. But, um, little did I know my story was just beginning, you know, my <laughs> journey just started like that, um, like us meeting was like the beginning of, of, of my, my darker days and, <laughs> and you know, and everybody always says like, you know, like someone told me the other day, when when you do when, when you when you go to shoot an arrow, you pull it back, and the further you pull it back, the further it shoots, right? Yeah. And so I experienced this point in my life where I was pulled back. I was pulled back away from society. I was pulled back from myself. I was pulled back spiritually. I was pulled back emotionally, and I feel like I'm getting to that point of release because I'm like, you know, it takes what a year for homeostasis to even occur in the brain from something like methamphetamines. I did a lot of research on this. Yeah, and I actually wrote a research paper on this last semester. Um, but it takes, I mean, I, I did it on and off for five years. I mean, it's going to take me 18 months for my brain to even be where it was. And I'm excited for that. I'm looking forward to that because I feel myself becoming sharper and sharper. Yeah. Like you can tell. Yeah. You can tell a difference. Like you were around me when I was like, what, 90 days in versus like. In Texas? In or? Texas, yeah. Yeah. But now you've gone off again. So what would you say to me and everyone listening? Because every time you've been on this podcast, you've relapsed and yeah. then you're clean. Right. <laughs> Literally every, you except know, the but, first time you were on the podcast, you hadn't done shit yet. Right. The but first every time, time since I, then, I had not touched drugs. The story is you re- relapsed, I relapsed and now yeah. you're on the fucking up and up. Um, well. So I'm, what's, what's to convince, not that you got to convince anybody, right, but like. Right. Well, people get tired of hearing the same thing over and over again. And I get that. Well, here's what, what's different. Um, I, I started believing in God. If I'm going to be completely honest with you, um, I didn't believe in God for a long time. And did you ever believe in God? Yeah, I, I did as a child. I believed okay. in God as a kid. 
and things happen in my life and I abandoned my relationship with God and I stopped believing in God. And then I thought that I was God. Okay. And I was like, you know, it was this whole thing. So, um, this is the longest period since I started doing amphetamines that I've had clean. This is the longest, 11 months. Yeah. And um, we talk a lot about people being desperate to get clean. And, like, I'm at a point where I'm desperate to not go backwards. Yeah. Like, I have that desperation. And I have this relationship with God today. Um, and I know that God's will for my life is not to be someone who is strung out on drugs. Yeah. And, and what I have now that I didn't have before is um, independence. I was never... I wasn't independent before, you know, I, um, you know, no. Rob and I were together. I was always in these very codependent relationships. Uh, okay. You know, when I was living in Texas, you know, they were providing me with housing and food. I had nothing, you know, yeah. and, and like this, I'm standing like for the first time in, in five years on my own two feet. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm investing in my education. I'm learning, I've learned how to take care of myself again. Um, and I think, I think that's the major difference. And, and then like my relationship with, with a God of my understanding and just understanding that I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. Like I'm not running, I'm not the person who's running all this, <laughs> all the, the whole show, you know, like my, but you're running your own life. You I'm know? managing my life and with the help of others, you know, I, I have a mentor. I, I ask for help. I ask for guidance and, um, and I know that this is going to be a lifelong process for me. It's going yeah. to be a forever thing. Um, and I'm cool with that today. And, and I'm, I've been seeking to, to right my wrongs. And, and the, the best way for me to right my wrongs is to live differently. It's to improve my character and to live differently than the way I was living. You know, Because for a long time I wanted to victimize myself and blame other people. But what it comes down to is just taking responsibility for myself. Like, I hurt a lot of people. Um, I was dishonest. Uh, I hurt myself, you know? And, and like, the disrespect I, I I displayed internally for myself, I, I displayed to other people, you know? And, and I, I let a lot of people down. And, you know, I wanted to blame everybody else for so long, but like at the end of the day, regardless of what anybody does, my actions are my choice. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what you do to me. The way that I react to you has everything to do with me and nothing to do with whoever else is involved. And I'm beginning to understand I can't control anything out here. The only thing I can control is the way that I act and the way that I treat others. And I, I truly believe so long as I... Um, Maintain an attitude of love, kindness, and understanding. Um, and understand that my purpose is to be helpful on this planet and not hurtful. And that includes to myself, right? Yeah. Because I was so hurtful towards myself. Like, man. <sighs> well, yeah. I mean, that's how, <laughs> that's how it goes. Like, and I couldn't help myself. I didn't know how to help myself because I was so busy hurting myself. Yeah, and, but, uh, um, you know, for most of your life, you've been okay. You know, yeah, like I was just, okay. And, <laughs> yeah. like, like, I didn't get hooked on drugs till I was 28 years old. Yeah. I had a life. I had a life prior to drugs. I mean, when I met you, you were a fully formed person. Totally more or less. functioning adult. And you'd never done drugs before. So right. it's only only really been... Five years. Yeah. Five years of my life. So it's... So it, it's... You got a pretty good shot. I got a good <laughs> chance. And, like, I'm beginning <laughs> to remember these... Um, parts of my personality that I lost touch with, right? Because, like, I did drugs to numb a lot of pain. and But when you do that, you don't get to pick and choose which parts of you you numb. And I numbed my personality yeah. um, when I did that. And I'm getting back in touch with these parts of my personality because I was so isolated. And I'm learning, oh, I'm an extrovert. Oh, I'm a people person. Huh. Um, I like to dance and sing and you know what I mean? Like, you see me, like, my personality is coming back to life. And I'm, like, trying to love me for, like, that person. Yeah. You know? Because I felt so ashamed of that. Because I was, you know, I was in the <laughs> public spotlight. You get a lot of criticism and scrutiny. Like, I was very, under a lot of scrutiny for a long time. And um, 
I'm beginning to understand that my relationship with myself is one of the most important relationships I can have. And it's the one I neglected the most. So how do you feel, and I'm projecting myself onto you now. Okay. Uh, as far as like living in Sioux City for however long. Do you I, think about it? Have you thought about it? Or? You know, I'm, I'm in school. I can do my job for four years. So as of right now, I plan on being here for the next couple of years. I'm trying to stay put. Okay. You know, um, I was on the go for a long time. I think being grounded and plugging into a community is good for me. Not yeah. to say I'm not going to vacation, because I am. Yeah. You know, I am. I, I was trying to get you down to Omaha tomorrow. I know, I know, like, but I can't leave my cat. Um, just 100 miles away. But I'll get a cat sitter. I'm going to hit the road. No worries on that. Drag this cat um, out of here. But, but I like my home here, because I worked really hard for it. And I like getting to know my community. And Well, it's pretty cool. I it's mean, awesome. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shitting on myself a little bit by saying i'm projecting myself onto you but i love to come here and just like come down to the coffee shop and just like meet uh kitty kitty bang bang and uh brutal doodles, brutal doodles and these yeah. girls and just like and i fucking love it that i'm just like yeah i know liz and they're like oh yeah <laughs> and then just like and then to know the town and then to go to jackson brewery over here and then it's yeah. like oh it's all going on like it's, it's very fucking awesome it's amazing, right. and I had forgotten what it felt like to live in a place and be a part of, you know, the community. Yeah. Because I haven't done that in so long. And, like, I'm thriving. Like, it's so good for me. And, and you know, the whole, like, applying to be a muralist thing, like, I'm, I'm putting myself out there again. Yeah. And, like, someone told me um, I was coloring with, with uh, Brutal Doodles, Jessica Hammond, at the festival and she goes I'm glad you're doing that and it made me feel so freaking good you know like somebody's glad that I want to get out and paint yeah you know somebody's <laughs> glad that I want to come volunteer at their event because those things were impossible for me for a long time yeah and like people are glad that I'm showing up to their yoga <laughs> classes and like you know that feels so good and it's so motivating like when you're met with appreciation you want to do more when, yeah. You know, when you do things and it's met with appreciation, it's motivating to do more. Yeah. And, like, I'm beginning to really love this place. I'm, like, just starting to love it. Yeah. I mean, well, you turned me on to it pretty quickly. And, like, yeah. I stay with a lot of people in a lot of places. And uh, I'm not going to say it happens all the time. But when it does, I really like it. When I do walk around town and I'm just like, I'm staying with so-and-so, in this case, Liz. And they're just like, oh, yeah. And then, like, this and that. Like... It's a cool feeling, you know? And me, I'm just like a, a passer buyer. But, yeah. like, but I see it and I, I love it because there's like, it means something, you know? It's meaningful. And My then, life has meaning. And it, it changes the whole town for me, just the fact that we can walk through uh, the skywalks and just see like, oh, it's like your friend has like done all the art <laughs> in yeah, the skywalks, these right. murals. It's like brutal doodles. I kn that's your friend. Yeah. <laughs> like, and we just saw her at the beer fest. Like yeah. it changes the whole town for me. And I imagine just like the whole, the whole town, like for them to experience that. It's just like, yeah. This and place that's means be, a lot to me. Like, I, yeah. it's like, I find meaning in so many things here and like, I get to feel feelings today. Feel feelings? <laughs> I get to feel feelings. <laughs> but like my life didn't have a lot of meaning for a really long time because I couldn't, I could barely leave my room, you know? Yeah. And um, this place has come to mean so much to me. And like people see me out and they're like, oh, I saw you out walking your cat. <laughs> oh yeah you know because like I, I walk usually if i walked around town i was just like walking around and it's like oh your friend that's the one who does meth in her basement all the time right, <laughs> like, right. that, that friend, doesn't happen <laughs> that the doesn't junkie happen that can't leave her bedroom you yeah know? but the one who like connects people or helps people or does I art network. or something i've like... always been really good at networking but i love bringing people together you know because like yeah. um i was very lonely for a long time and i always just had this passion about bringing people together and doing something great you know, that's always been my thing. Like, let's all get together and do something great. Yeah. And, like, I'm doing that in small steps here. And I'm taking on small commitments because, you know, um, I'm slowly easing myself back into it. And it's just everything I've done here it just means a lot to me because it's like my, it's my new life. You know, this is my, 
<laughs> this cat means the world to me. It's a pretty good cat. He's amazing. I gotta say... You're awesome, Benjamin. Probably top five. Probably top five so, for me. But yeah, it just... And I got... I'm, I'm getting inspired again. You know, I'm making art that's like Sioux City inspired. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. You know, like I'm getting back into it. And, and like, my life has taken on new meaning and I'm beginning to to value these connections again and I'm uh, I'm done hiding from the world. I'm done. I'm just I'm done. I'm done with the I'm done yeah. with that period of my life. I think people get trapped in addiction and think this is who I am and they identify with it. And I'm beginning to identify that as just a stop biting. <laughs> no. No. Benjamin does he doesn't not even care. Fuck. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to understand that that was just a brief, dark period. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? That's temporary. That defining of who I am. I'm so much more than that, you know? No. Um, I'm someone who genuinely cares for others today. And I'm someone who genuinely has always just wanted, like I said, bring people together and make the world a better place. Unity is a powerful thing. Yeah. I'm beginning to realize. And, and the way that I experience this unity is... I experience humility and then I take responsibility and then I'm able to experience unity and it's so freeing and um, you know I'm able to like look at myself in the mirror today like just little stuff that I couldn't do before you know and yeah my self-talk my inner voice has gotten a lot more positive and and that's made a huge difference um, but yeah I love Sioux City I just I love it I love so, it here. I love my apartment. I love my cat. I love my friends. I love you. Yeah. Since we're on the freestyle travel show, uh-huh. we are in Sioux City, and uh, you are trying to like establish your your shit here, which yeah. you've you've done to an extent. Yeah. But what sort of travels do you think you want to go on in just the next year or two? Next year, okay. Um, I will be going to see my son. Kansas City. Kansas City. So I'll do that thing. I'll see Brett while I'm there. You know, I love Brett. Yeah. And then, um, shout out to Brett. And I will be going down south to see my family. I got invited back home. You know, I hadn't seen my family really in five years. Yeah. Since the whole debacle down south. You know, they were kind of like, just like, don't ever come back here again. (laughs) But Um, you're welcome back now. So in my recovery process, um, I realized that I'd hurt my family. And I reconnected with them, and um, I got I got invited to to see my family, so I'm going to do that. Um, they're on Kansas City too. No, 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 they're in Alabama. Oh, yeah. Your mom comes up to Kansas City though. She has a spot there. Okay, yeah. she's got the Alabama spot though. But she has a house in Alabama, so I got invited to see my family, which meant the world to me, and that's really motivating because it's like a sign like you're doing the right thing, you know? Yeah. Because being disowned by your family is hard. <laughs> like I don't yeah. know many people who have experienced that, or if you have any experience with that. But that in itself is a monster because like you feel like it's gross. It's like I don't have anyone. Yeah. You know, I felt like the odd man out and like their lives went on without me, you know, and I'm looking around and like my cousins are like getting married and graduating from school and, and it's like, where was, where have I been? I missed out on all this stuff, Yeah. you know, but that was my choice, you know, um, and, and unfortunately when you make certain choices and they have consequences, you chose those consequences too, you know, but like. Feeling accepted and loved by my family has been, it meant the world to me. Like, it just, it's been everything. Like, there have been nights, like, I fully prepared myself to never see them again. And I yeah. can't tell you what that feels like emotionally and mentally. Like, I fully accepted, like, I'll probably never see my grandmother before she dies. I'll never step foot into my mother's house again. Uh, my aunts and uncles won't speak to me. My cousins no. are ashamed of me. You know, my brothers and sisters want nothing to do with me. Yeah. And um, I had accepted all of that as true. And for them to even, like, speak to me now, like, it's meaningful. You know, I took my family for granted, and and I will never do that again. Hmm. You know, their love and acceptance is, like, I'm getting all these good things that are motivating for that are, like, they give me this momentum and this good direction, you know, and it's, like, I don't want to lose those things again. 
Yeah. You know, I have too much to lose now. Do you think you go on like a family trip? A little Myrtle Beach action? A little I Barcelona? Know. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think, I don't know if they're ready for that. You know, they're just now invite, getting to a point where like, we want to see you. Oh, uh, okay. Much less like, come on down. Come on our family vacation with us. You know, I don't know yeah. if I'm that much into the family yet. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, so far, no. But, you know, anything can happen. Um, but that's a lot, that's a lot to deal with, you know, um, and like, I'm still working through some of that because mentally and emotionally preparing yourself to never see anyone, you know, again, <laughs> is a lot, is heavy. And, yeah. and that's where I was, you know, um, that's just how it was. And, and like, hopefully those relationships continue to grow, but relationships are like flowers. You got to water them, you got to nourish them, you got to give them <laughs> sunshine. You know, I have to do my part. And I do my part every day by not picking up drugs. And I do my part by taking yeah. care of myself. And I do my part by helping others. And I do my part by growing spiritually and, and you know, and, and treating myself with some dignity and respect. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't respect others if you don't have any self-respect is there anywhere around here uh that you're like kind of stoked even within a few hundred miles just to like check out i've never been to minneapolis um, what the fuck i've never been so i want to i'm go going to, there when are you going like immediately like the only reason i'm are not you going hitchhiking there. yeah should we do minneapolis together you got a cat you can eat you, benjamin benjamin can you hitchhike the only reason I'm not going to, so I'm going to go to Omaha, I guess, tomorrow. Yeah, right. But then I'm going to Minneapolis, unless I come here. Like, literally, Minneapolis is the next actual place I want to go. I'm only going okay. to Omaha because I'm going to go to that casino to edit you video. You got a free room. I got the free room. I'm going to edit video. We'll do this. Go to Omaha and then come back here, and then let's go to Minneapolis. You're going to go with me? How long are we going to be there? I mean, as long as you want to go. And will you hitchhike back here with me? I can. Yeah, I'm down. Okay, I'll find a cat sitter in the next few hours, next 48 hours. Really? And I'll go to Minneapolis with you. All right. We got it on film. <laughs> That's candid. We're going to go see my buddy Nick. Okay. Nick is... The shit. He's the good Nick. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the, yeah. No. I don't think your other friend Nick was too big of a fan of me. But that's fine. Uh, I wasn't a fan of myself. Oh, well, Nick was terrible to everybody. Well, okay. he was good to some people. But he was... No, but the Nick in Minneapolis is the fucking great Nick. So Nick in Minneapolis, I met him in uh, Alaska when I volunteered for couch surfing yeah so when i volunteered for couch surfing i hitchhiked to alaska from new orleans it took me two weeks oh nice and this is actually kind of funny because i got all the way it took all this time through canada and then finally i was getting up to homer and i went the directions they gave me to get there was like you'll pass some trees and there'll be a cabin <laughs> i'm serious so i got down a hill i'm like fuck I think I passed the trees <laughs> in the cabin. So I'm like, I think I got to go back. So then I got picked up by these two people and I was like, yeah, these are the directions. And they're like, <laughs> and it was Doogie and Shanali. These two people who work for couch surfing. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so they took me there, but they were on their way to do stuff. And then I walked into the house and this guy, super friendly, was making these like cream pies <laughs> and stuff. Oh, He's I like, like him already. <laughs> yeah, that's Nick. And nice. then we became, I've seen Nick in more countries and states than any other person in my life. I've seen him in Asia. I've seen him in Europe. I've seen him in Thailand. Nice. Yeah. Thailand's what I want to do with my $4,000 that I save from smoking. Oh, there you go. But he's in Minneapolis now. So that's the only reason I'm going to Minneapolis. So that's if it. you want to come, he'd be super down, I'm sure. Okay. Well, we're going to um, tune in next week. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny and I, Freestyle Travel and Life Sucks, which is my podcast, shameless plug. I started a new podcast called Life Sucks. Oh, the airport shit. abbreviation, stop it, I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> the airport abbreviation here is S-U-X, mm -hmm. which I think is hilarious. 
Um, so my podcast is called Life Sucks, S-U-X. There you go. And yeah, exactly. And it's just me getting to know um, Iowa and like my area. So I'm going to bring on like local interesting people I find and talk to them and um, get to know this place and appreciate it and build, you know, more community and bring more people together and see what happens because that's what I do, you know. Okay. And if she keeps her secret or uh, not secret, promise. If you keep your promise, uh -huh. we'll be in Minneapolis like in a week or two. Okay. Well... We'll see you in Minneapolis. And if not, she's probably back on drugs. Oh, shut up. <laughs> That's a freestyle travel show, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to end on that. <laughs> if I can. You got anything else to say? No, I got to go to bed. I got to take a college algebra final tomorrow. All right. That's it. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye. We'll see you in Minneapolis. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Liz, for being on the show once again. Uh, forget if we figured out if it was her fourth or fifth time on the show but uh yeah good times hanging out with her so just rewinding to last week or whatever it was I uh, hitchhiked from Wyoming to Iowa to Sioux City to see Liz and uh pretty easy got up from Alpine to Jackson in one ride that was like a 30 40 minute ride i got a ride through jackson town just a few minutes got me to the edge of the city a uh, local guy another guy gave me a ride to the airport entrance uh, another short ride and then another short ride inching closer to like yellowstone but still with the tetons there and then this guy picked me up and he said he was going to cape cod uh, massachusetts so i was in there so I rode with that guy all day into the night. Uh, super cool guy. He's traveled all over the place. So it was just nonstop uh, telling stories back and forth. Uh, while still in Wyoming around midnight, we found a place to pull off the side of the road. Quiet little exit. Um, he had an air mattress side. My bivy, of course, just sort of camped next to the truck for four or five hours till the sun started uh, peeking up a little bit. And yeah got going and drove further got to sioux falls uh that's where he dropped me off and i got a quick ride from a truck driver who was going to oklahoma city actually super cool guy he had actually seen me and then stopped at a truck stop and he was like i guess he told me talking with another truck driver like deciding which one of them was gonna pick me up that's <laughs> kind of cool so he gave me a ride into Sioux City. Uh, I had some books on hand, my Nomadic Moonlight book. So I gave him a copy. He didn't have any cash, and I told him not to worry about it. You know, he gave me a ride. I could care less if he paid me, uh, but he insisted on getting me lunch, so I'm not going to say no to that. So that was cool. Arrived into Sioux City and got a meal right away, a little diner. And, uh, yeah, walked up and uh, caught up with Liz pretty quickly. And, yeah. Just hung out with her for, felt like about a week, maybe a little shy of a week. And uh, there's this big RAGBRAI thing going on. It's an acronym for something, but basically it's the biggest uh, casual bike, bicycle thing <laughs> in, in the world. So it's like 30,000 people get on bicycles and they spend a week uh, riding across Iowa. And every day they get to a new town where it's basically a festival waiting for them. And uh, this year it started in Sioux City. So that's what all the buzz was getting in there for the weekend. Um, people were pretty hyped on that. And then just, yeah, thousands of bicycles all over town camping here and there. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Got to experience that. I filmed a hopping episode at Jefferson Beer Supply just outside of Sioux City, maybe 10, 15 miles outside of the city. So that'll be going on and then i also had a book signing at jackson street brewery which was a block away from where liz lived uh and filmed a little bit with them too so i'll probably have one like iowa <laughs> episode even though actually jefferson's technically in south dakota i don't know i'll figure out a name for it but i'll probably uh, edit it into one episode so Got that done last night, actually. Yeah, so last night was the book signing, the filming at uh, Jackson Street. And then we came back and uh, recorded the chat you just saw. And this morning, I decided to hitchhike down to Council Bluffs. <laughs> so that's where I am right now. Still in Iowa, just on the other side of the river from Omaha, Nebraska. 
there is a Harris, which is, I am inside Harris Casino, so I'm able to stay here for free for four nights, you know, typical casino thing. The casino itself is kind of a turd or whatever, but I'm here just to uh, relax and edit video. And uh, yeah, I got a bunch of free food while I'm here. They have this like lounge thing I can go into and uh, they had shepherd's pie for free today in Guinness, so that was cool. So yeah, I'll be chilling here for the next uh, few nights, editing video and <laughs> just getting some stuff done. Uh, hitchhiking down here today was hot, <laughs> hot and uh, humid for sure. It's just like sweating, walking, um, but I got one short ride from a guy in a truck and then uh, eventually this guy, farmer from North Dakota with his two kids picked me up. He was going down to Missouri to pick up 700 chicks. So. He's got that little business going on. So, yeah, I'm here. That's what's up. Um, I know I'm going to Minneapolis to see a buddy. Um, not sure exactly how soon. Probably pretty soon. So that's kind of the next move that I got. Uh, but, yeah, we'll chill out here for a few days and uh, see what happens. <laughs> Get some videos up. So look out on the uh, Hopping channel in particular. I think I'm going to get the Idaho episode up uh, first, so that's what's up. Um, yeah, till the next episode, hope you guys are all doing good, and I will see you down the road.